Good morning, everyone, everywhere, and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. Here in Alaska, the season is changing. School is well underway. There is a little bit of nip in the air in the evenings, and cranes are starting to fly away. At this change in the season, it's always a wonderful time to renew our commitment to practices. And I hope that one of your practices will be to join us for worship every Sunday morning. If you are one of our regular attenders, welcome back. And if you are a new visitor today and you are using this unique opportunity in history to try church in this online way, then I want you to know how glad I am to have you join us here today. Let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship today. I invite you to print out or pull up your worship guide so you can follow along with the prayers and liturgy today. Light a candle as a reminder of the light of Christ that connects us all no matter where we are. And take a deep breath remembering that you are standing on holy ground. Let's turn our hearts and minds toward God in worship as we sing Pass It On. Let us pray. Risen Christ, fill us with your spirit and speak peace to us through these words of scripture. Help us rejoice in you always and strengthen us to press on through all our difficult times. As we hear your words, let our love overflow with knowledge and insight and teach us to live in you to the glory and praise of God. Amen. As a literate society, it's hard for us sometimes to really take in and comprehend information if we're not reading it ourselves with our own eyes. But we remember that those original Christian churches scattered around the ancient world were made up of a huge variety of people, slave and free from every level of the class structure, women and men, young and old, and not everyone was literate. There was not the modern technologies we have to reproduce things that were written. And so the main way 
that people worshiped together when they received a letter from the Apostle Paul was to read that letter out loud in worship where everyone could hear it and then talk about it afterwards, discuss what he was saying, see how it applied to their churches and their lives. So during this series called We've Got Mail, we are using our spiritual imaginations to put ourselves back in the place of those ancient churches so that when we receive a letter from Paul, we listen to it read aloud and then start thinking about some of the points that he's made. So let's raise up our spiritual imaginations today as we head over to the church and check the mail. Let's take a look and read what Paul has written to us today. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. 
for many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears, their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation so that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I have lots of reactions to this section of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let me ask you this. Have you been pandemic purging? Have you been using this opportunity uh, where we are at home a little bit more to clean out your house and your garage and go through old boxes? Joe and I have, and it's always interesting, the things that turn up when we start clearing out the house. This week, Paul's letter really made me think about credentials. He talks about his own credentials, who he was as a Jewish man, as a Pharisee, as a follower of Christ. And it made me think about my own credentials when we opened up a box and found my stack of diplomas. <laughs> there, there is a, quite a big stack. Joe and I were joking that we don't want to calculate the amount of money that these represent, including that one on the wall that we're still paying off. But I found my high school diploma from Robert Service High School in Anchorage. I found my Bachelor of Arts in English and Literature. I found my Master of Teaching degree from my first career as a teacher. And of course, I found uh, the folder that held this degree from Duke University, my divinity degree um, that I had to get as part of my call into the ordained ministry. I found some more credentials as well. I found the preaching award that I won when I was at Duke Divinity School and found the certificate that I received when I was commissioned as a provisional elder when I was first sent here to serve the congregation in Homer. Uh, somewhere at home or in my office, there's also my ordination certificate, that final credential that I received when the bishop laid hands on me and commissioned me to take thou authority to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to order the life of the church and perform the sacraments with you. Paul had this huge long list of credentials and his were incredibly impressive. A Hebrew born of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day as was required by law, not just a, a Jewish believer, not just a follower of the law, but a Pharisee, one of the scholars of the law, and a persecutor of the church. He lists out all of these credentials, those things that should have made him a holier and more blameless, cleaner than everyone else. And yet he says, I regard those things as rubbish. And I think about what it means for my own credentials, my own stack of things that really are rubbish if I do not preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ with love, joy, mercy, justice, and grace. As Christians, we can fall into this credentialing process, but 
we know that we can wear all the cross jewelry we want. We can have a Jesus fish on our car. We can get a gold star for attendance at church every Sunday morning. And yet, if we are not living the gospel of Jesus Christ every day, living out our faith by loving God with our heart, souls, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves, then all of this is rubbish. Paul, like I said last week, is very much a practical theologian. Faith is not just a feeling in the heart. It's not just an intellectual exercise. It is a lived activity. And none of our credentials mean anything unless we are living out our faith every day. Paul then also talks about false teachers, which I think is very closely related. Those false teachers might have all the credentials, but they're not preaching the gospel. Paul uses really harsh language here when he calls them dogs. If you remember earlier this summer, we encountered the story of Jesus and the Canaanite woman, and he made a comment to her equating her to a dog. And we talked about what an insult that was. And so Paul is using that same kind of harsh language. He doesn't name who they are in particular because he says, you know, that part doesn't matter. We know false teachers because of their actions. We can identify them because they are not teaching and living out the kingdom of heaven here on earth. They instead are preaching for the empire of the world. This summer, again, we talked about this epic battle that, that Paul describes with the kingdom of heaven up and against the empires of the world and how we as Christians are called to, to raise our sights above the everyday workings of the world and understand that there is an alternative way to live a way that is driven by mercy and salvation, healing and wholeness as the body of Christ here on earth. And so Paul says that those false teachers are the ones that are not preaching the kingdom of heaven, but those who are firmly rooted in the empires of the world. And he says that you know them by their worldly values. He lists some things to look for. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly. Their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. He doesn't have to list them by name because he probably couldn't list all of them by name. Instead, he gives people some qualities to look for, to help them gauge whether a teacher is a true teacher or a false teacher. And he says that those who are preaching the worldly values of wealth and power and, and gratification at the expense of other people, those are false teachers of whom to be aware because they're not preaching the self-sacrificing love of Jesus. There is a beautiful verse in this letter that so often gets poorly quoted. I wouldn't say misquoted, but purposefully cut a little short. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Isn't that a longing in our hearts that we have of wanting in all ways to experience the abundant eternal life of Christ? But that's not the whole verse. <laughs> Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of of his sufferings, 
by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It's a lot nicer if we only quote the first half of that verse, isn't it? <laughs> it is joyful to want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. But then Paul says, and share his suffering. Theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call this the difference between cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace is kind of that feel good, I want to focus on the happy parts of faith, whereas costly grace is that kind of grace that acknowledges that suffering may very well be a part of our faith. Suffering, standing up against the world around us, identifying ways that the empires of the world are at odds with the kingdom of God. That's costly. That's difficult. That is part of the work of faith. And Bonhoeffer knew what he was talking about because he was a German pastor and theologian who stood up against the Third Reich and was executed in a Nazi concentration camp. He knew cheap grace was not the way, and he chose costly grace, the grace that included suffering with Christ in order to also find that glory of Christ. Paul talks about false teachers who only focus on the, the worldly positive aspects of faith rather than on the whole journey of faith, which may very well include suffering and rejection and hardship. But we don't do it alone. We have Christ and we have one another. And Paul reminds us that faith is a journey. It is a race in his language. He talks about perseverance. We could talk about endurance as well. He talks about the ability to persevere and endure during difficult times is a Christian value. And he says that we press on, that we choose to keep going because we are people of hope. We know that there will be a better day ahead. We know that God is making all things new. We know that we are not on this journey by ourselves, but we have our Christian siblings by our sides. We have the companionship of our advocate, the Holy Spirit. We have our brother, Jesus Christ, and we have the power of God Almighty with us. And so Paul says that we press on we leave behind the things of the past and press on toward God's glorious future. My friends, I hold you in my heart and I thank God every time I think about you. On this journey of faith, through its glorious highs and its devastating lows, may you continue to press on, knowing that you are never alone. God bless you.
last week was a busy one in the life of the Greater Northwest Episcopal Area as our three conferences, Alaska, the Pacific Northwest, and the Oregon-Idaho conferences held our annual conference sessions online. It was a blessing to be able to gather together, even virtually, in order to worship together, to share our walk of faith together, and to do the business of the church. There will be a special Greater Northwest Area Worship Service this afternoon that you are all invited to attend. This service is called Breathing Smoke, Finding Hope, a time of prayer, reflection, and praise. We know that our United Methodist siblings in the greater Northwest area are suffering from incredible wildfires right now. Towns have been evacuated and some destroyed. Churches, schools, whole neighborhoods have been burned. People have been evacuated, which is difficult in the best of times and particularly challenging during this pandemic. We will gather together as a greater Northwest area to lift up our voices together in prayer. We will have music and liturgy and deep breathing through the fire, the smoke, the ash, the anxiety, and the grief of this time. You will also be invited to make a special offering for the disaster relief efforts of our sister conferences. You can also make a special donation through our giving portal, which you'll see on our church website. You'll see that we've added a line for wildfire relief efforts. 100% of your donations will go to disaster response in our sister conferences. I invite you at 3 p.m. today to tune in to this special worship service and add your voice to the cries we are lifting up to God as we stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in need. You can watch on YouTube or on Facebook. If uh, you have seen your worship guide, you'll see that I put the links in there. If you are watching this worship service on YouTube, then I'll put the links in the description box below. On Facebook, I'll add those links to the comment section. I invite you to participate in those worship services however you can, adding your prayers to all of the voices of our siblings of the greater Northwest area. Let us pray together as we dedicate our lives and our gifts to God. Merciful God, transform our offerings into hope and joy for a troubled world. Receive the blessings we return to you this day and transform our ministries into instruments of your grace. Through our giving, may places of sorrow and mourning Know the sound of love and laughter once again. Through our living, mold us into your people and help us press on together in our journey of faith. Amen. Please join me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Press on, my dear friends. Press on. <laughs>